my name is Scott Harmon. I'm the uh, co-founder and VP of operations for a privately funded uh, technology startup that um, is looking at the intersection of 3D printing, uh, retail, and uh, consumer goods like toys. I think that uh, I think that there are going to be some very fascinating uh, impacts on IP. I think um, as you invite the consumer in to collaborate with you, um, that consumers are going to do weird things, and some of those things uh, you might like a lot, some of those things you may not like at all. Um, we've already seen examples of people. Um, using just straight knockoffs of, uh, of existing IP and also doing things that are uh, mashups of different kinds of IPs. And some brands are going to be okay with that kind of stuff and some brands are not. I think, um, interestingly, there is a piece of it that IP owners are underestimating the value of today. And that is that as you invite the consumer into the conversation, you're actually building a direct relationship with your consumer. And so you can see the kinds of things that they want to do with your brand, which can then help you uh, to understand your consumer and to develop better products for those consumers. So um, one of the interesting examples, uh, Disney currently has a, uh, a theme park down in, or in Orlando where consumers can come in, they have their three-dimensional photograph taken, and then Disney takes the three-dimensional photograph and puts it onto their existing IPs. And so Cinderella doesn't look like Cinderella anymore, Cinderella looks like you. Um, and that's the forefront of it. Um, there are other brands, not necessarily consumer products brands, but brands like Invisalign, where the product itself is, uh, is tailored to the individual. Hearing aids are another example. And so the terms of those interactions are nowhere near set, and it's definitely at the exploratory phase. Um, but I think you're going to see more and more brands get into it. Ah, well, um, the short answer is that uh, I'm interested in the subject. Uh, I think that the thing that excites me the most is not necessarily the legal side of it, it's the collaboration side of it. And so one of the things that to me is the most interesting thing about 3D printing is that 3D printing is, um, is a tool for collaboration. And it allows people into the conversation, into the design conversation, that really before 3D printing had a difficult time with it. So whether it's um, somebody who didn't have a lot of money but had a cool idea, in a centralized manufacturing design environment, they don't really have a, a role to play. In the world of maker fairs and 3D printers, they do have a role to play. Uh, they can become involved. Um, companies themselves that have 3D printing, now the marketing and the sales organization can become involved in the design conversation, whereas before that wouldn't really have been possible. The tools just weren't there. So uh, I'm attracted to the collaboration side of it. Yeah, certainly. So um, cost. Uh, the, the machines are certainly coming down in cost, but they're still relatively expensive. I mean, as you know, we don't all have them in our home, so it's not uniquely uh, universally available to people. Um, and, and frankly, the materials, the, the quality of the output of the 3D printers, while interesting and good for some kinds of things, is certainly not universally applicable. Um, you can't, I mean, you can make maybe a component of a shoe or an iPhone case, but you certainly can't make um, uh, most real products. So I think there's a lot of development still to be done in improving the, the speed, the quality of the output and things like that. Um, and hopefully dem the demand is there to, uh, to see that innovation through. I think that uh, the technology not being quite there enough is certainly one of the obstacles to broader collaboration and utilization. Um, but it is also a behavioral thing, both on the part of the kind of consumer designer and the, the existing brands. Um, the existing brands have an enormous amount to protect and are nervous. Um, and the language between the two and how they interact and what are the rules of that interaction are still very much in play and being explored um, today. So I do think it's both a behavioral um, obstacle and also a technology obstacle. I think the, 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 the impact of the human being on 3D printing is going to be very interesting. Human beings by themselves are inherently unique. And um, it, this concept of design and collaboration is, is interesting when you're talking about a product. But if we're honest with ourselves, we are seeing innovations in life sciences where 3D printed customized goods are being used for everything from hip implants to teeth implants and things like that. Um, there's the the fixing an existing medical problem you know, world of using customized tools. Uh, and then there's the augmentation uh, side of things. And so um, where does 3D printing go when people decide that it's not just for replacing your hip, it's now for augmenting through this or that or whatever else. I think that there's going to be some very interesting things that happen out of those conversations in the future. 
the first thing that happens is everything gets faster. And so one of the things that digital fabrication does is it takes the, the timeline between an idea and a physical object and reduces that very, very dramatically. Um, some of the panelists talked about that it may have been uh, weeks or months between some, when somebody had an idea and when they could get that idea committed to a design, get that design off to a model shop and have it turned around. Now that's happening in days uh, or hours. And so everything gets faster as a result of that. Um, the idea of expanded collaboration. Again, a physical object is something that lots of people can interact with. A CAD file is not really something that, that lots of people can interact with. And so I think you can bring more people into the conversation. And then the final area um, of, about what happens really is what are things that you can make with a 3D printer that you can't make any other way? And what kinds of businesses and opportunities does that enable? And so in aerospace, for instance, um, jet engines are going to become more fuel efficient, lighter weight, and everything else like that because they can create structures for the engine using a 3D printer that can't be created any other way. So I think those are the three kind of big things that happen. Um, I think um, I would add one of those, uh, one more, and that is when you put them into school, uh, you get a lot of smiles. Um, so you get kids who are finding ways of doing things and um, unlocking their own creativity in a way that I think is, is magical. I think that depends on the ratio of lawyers in the room, to be honest with you. No, I'm just <laughs> um, I think it has a huge impact because uh, these technologies um, are now becoming, people are generally aware of these technologies, but true understanding of 3D printing technologies and their impact on um, people and on economics and things like that, I think is um, still uh, at, its, at its early stage. And so to get a, people, a, a room of people together that come from all different kinds of industries and functional areas and things like that, to get a better understanding of what the technology is and how it's used and what it means, I think does have a broad impact. We have people from architecture, we have people from service process design in the room, academics, and they all approach the problem from a different place. So yeah, I think it has um, an enormous ripple effect. And um, given the creativity that, that 3D printing enables, uh, who knows where that goes. Um, so it's exciting to be here.